Here we go. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you so much for tuning in again for Tune In with Boone. Uh, this is episode three now, and I have a very special guest. Uh, his IMDb goes on for a very long time, and you can find his voice in countless animated movies, series, video games, commercials, and promos. I do not have time to go over the full list, but for most of you listening, probably the most famous credit you're going to be familiar with is Porky the Pig. Please welcome from your home. I know I won't be able to hear your applause, Mr. Bob Bergen. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much I'm, for Bob. And by for the being way, I, I appreciate that. I'm going to correct you already. Please. Porky's name does not have a the. I'm so sorry. That's it's, a now the, error. the only the that I can think of for the classic character is Winnie the Pooh. I'm not sure what the Pooh means, but it's not do I? Mickey. It's not Mickey the Mouse. It's not Donald the Duck. It's Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck. Bugs Bunny, Porky Pig, but that is a very common mistake for your generation. That's I, you know, I guess we must have grown up with with a lot of characters with a the in the name. <laughs> because, but what a rookie! What a terrible amateur mistake to start on. I apologize, I, but I do appreciate I, the lesson, and I appreciate the lovely introduction. And uh, forgive me for correcting, but I do that every time people do it. And I would say ninety nine percent of my interviews, people say Porky the Pig. And I'm, I'm like, sorry to not, contribute. It's not fat the Albert, you know. So anyway, it's a common mistake. So and by the way, thank you for plugging my IMDb. Some of it is even true. A lot of it is false, but that's what IMDb is. That's it, you know. To proceed with caution both to IMDb and Wikipedia. Apparently, Jeff Bennett and Colette Sunderman are brother and sister, which is not true. Uh, How about that? <laughs> yes. It still says that. I've talked to Jeff about it. Uh, yeah, okay. they're most certainly not related. So, yeah, be careful. That's another life lesson. Just be careful what you read on the Internet. And remember, it's Porky Pig. So thank you. Um, I'm not going to do. We just went over this. We were talking about keeping this interview as not redundant as possible. And there are countless interviews already with Bob out there where he goes into great detail about how he got started into the industry, what inspired him starting at a very young age. Um, and there's a lot. I would highly recommend any interview that Rob Paulson's done. You can find them for free on Spotify, Talking Tunes. They're all available, especially if you're an aspiring voice actor in general. Just great and valuable information for completely free. VO Buzz Weekly, another great one on YouTube. So there you go. There's a lot to be covered. So I just want to get right into it. Um, and this is my first question that I think is uh, very relevant right now. Uh, many of us are guilty of craving in instant success, myself included. Um, and I feel like my relationship with that has changed a lot. But your story, Bob, is really one of persistence, ambition, and intense dedication. What advice or insight might you offer to someone who's interested in this career path, but at the very start of their journey and unsure of how to work towards their goals? Great question. Um, first of all, I never wanted instant success. I wanted to be able to pay my bills as a working actor. That's it. Um, I am a, a painfully shy person. One of the things I loved about the world of voiceover is you could be a working actor, but you're anonymous. Nobody knows who you are. And then we get this thing called the internet where everybody knows everything about everybody. Uh, and then fan conventions where, you know, it's kind of uh, good for your career to show up and meet the fans and sign stuff and be visible. So uh, being painfully shy, uh, being known is not, was never a goal and it's not something I enjoy, but it is what it is. It comes with the territory. Um, People need to stop. Uh, they need to stop having a uh, a goal to be a success. They should have a goal to have fun uh, at voiceover. Just have fun. The problem with you know I've got a I want instant success. If I were to say to them, well, what does success mean? They don't have an answer. They don't have it. I just want to work. Well, that's why you're not because you don't know specifically what you want to do. Uh, you must know specifically what you want out of your voiceover career so you then can strategically uh, create a roadmap to get there. And most people who say, I just want to work, who aren't working, have no idea what their career, their successful career might look like. For instance, uh, what I teach my students uh, is what I call backwards thinking where don't think, okay, now I take some classes and when I'm ready, I make a demo and then try to get an agent and get some up. No, 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 no. 
if you had a magic wand and you could create what your instant success would look like, what would it look like? And, I, and we'll use animation uh, as an example, because that's what I teach. Oh, I just want to do voices that make people happy. I hate that. Make people happy. Um, no, no, specifically, where do you want to work in animation? Um, I just want to be creative. But no, 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 specifically, what do you want to be doing? Well, I don't know what you mean. Okay, specifically, my goal is to work on a Pixar animated feature. That's specific. They don't do that many of them. I didn't have the internet when I was starting out. So somebody with that specific goal can go to IMDb and cross-reference every Pixar movie from the producers to the writers, to the actors, to the actors' agents, to the executive producer, the, 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 the director of animation, the animators, et cetera. And start looking for patterns. Um, you're going to see a lot of celebrities put those aside because that doesn't represent the day-to-day -day voiceover actor. Look at the day-to-day -day voiceover actors, the pe people like me or people like Lori Allen or uh, uh, Debbie Derryberry, uh, Danny Mann, people who have worked a lot uh, on, on Pixar films. And then cross-reference who their agents are. You are going to see the exact same agents. Atlas Talent, CESD, DPN, AVO, Box, SBV, etc. Logic tells you, you need to be represented by one of the top voiceover agents that represent animation and have clients that work on Pixar films. Okay. Then you need to go to those actors' websites and listen to their demos. You need to be better than them. Have characters that they don't already do because that's why when, a, when an agent says, we've got too many of your type because you're... you're you're, you're giving them a demo that these agents already represent. They've got valley girls, they've got old men, they've got little kids, they need original characters. And then you're gonna look at this laundry list of things that you need to do to get to a point where you want to compete to try to get a job on a Pixar film. And then you're gonna realize none of that can be done instantly. I'm going back to your original question now. Mm -hmm. There ain't nothing instant about success. And what's happened is it started with MTV before the internet. And then you add the internet to that. Everything is instant gratification. You post a video immediately. And all people want is followers, friends, and likes. They feel value. And, the, and, and I've had people get angry, literally. Send me DMs. I'm really upset with you. You haven't liked my posts in a long time. And I'm like, how would you know if, if unless you were neur neurotic about checking? And why are you? This is also why people want instant success in voiceover because they want instant gratification in life. It's detrimental. It's dangerous. It's unhealthy. So forget instant success in voiceover to this day i'm very grateful for my career i don't take it for granted i work as hard i work harder today to stay where i'm at than i ever did to get here yeah i believe it and i count my blessings and with every audition i get the same giddy butterflies in my stomach as i did when i got into the business 40 something years ago that has not changed and i never auditioned to book a thing I audition just to have fun. And if I do book it, I got to go back in my file. Well, the first thing I said to my agent is that I read for that. Because once <laughs> yeah. I've read for it and sent it, yeah, I forget it. You have to. And, and again, if you hang on to it, you're going to be neurotic. But I audition to have fun. I, I don't audition to please anybody but me in the booth because there's nobody else there but me in the booth. And I really don't care if I don't get it. And if I do get it, it's icing on the cake. Yeah. Long-winded answer to that question. It's a, it's a wonderful it. answer, and I hope people are listening to every bit of it because there are several really wonderful nuggets of wisdom in there. I think especially at the end, I mean, I'm sure you've had many instances where you've auditioned for something and probably haven't heard about it until, I don't know, six months later, and then you have a callback or then you book the job. It happens. Yeah, that's so. it. That's, and people, or 
you read for it at 9 a.m. and you get a call at 10 o'clock saying you booked it. Are you available for the session this, this afternoon? This people are so, um, oh my God, they they try to fix themselves every time they're not booking. Right. There are so many reasons why a brilliant read does not get booked. The number one reason is they can only book one person. Right. That's it. Yes. But every time an actor doesn't book, they try to coach themselves into being better. If they're brilliant, they're going to remember that you were brilliant. And if you didn't get booked, even with a brilliant submission, let's say the casting director loved you, they're going to love you the next time. They're going to find something they think you're right for. Maybe the producer wanted a celebrity. Maybe that you you worked for this production company several times and they want some somebody new. Maybe they want somebody older, somebody younger, whatever. But today's audition is an insurance policy for another opportunity. And I can't tell you how many times people will try to fix themselves. Yeah. Now, there are also some people who shouldn't be auditioning because they're not audition ready. Yep. But they do it anyway. Why? Because they want instant success. You know, I have I have a lot of things I could jump on and go over based on what you just said. That is wonderful. But because of how where you just ended it, I think it it kind of lands perfectly into the next question I had prepared, which is to talk about the rise of social media, because I think yeah. that is directly related to a lot of the instant success craving and the changing landscape, which I want to get into a lot. I think with social media being so available and widespread access to content creation, a lot of work is now non-union. There's a, even animation. There's a lot of independent creators producing things for YouTube. They're paying, you know, not SAG rates necessarily, but enough where many people feel comfortable uh, auditioning for and taking those jobs. And many people are making at least part of their living as non-union actors. And a lot of them don't even have agents. Now, I personally, a little tidbit about myself, grew up with a father who's a professional actor. So my point of reference was always, you get very good at your craft and then you get an agent and hopefully you get work and you join the union and that's how you become a professional actor in a very, very simple, you know, simply put way. Uh, but I'm just curious of what advice or insight you might offer to someone um, who, well, I did already said that, but <laughs> I guess I, my, my real question is, what do you think just in general of the landscape shifting for, uh, you know, I'm sure you've noticed these people who now are, are working and they're doing their thing and they're not necessarily following what might be considered the traditional path. Well, it, the, the internet's not new. It's over 20 years old. Um, this whole uh, erosion of the union voiceover industry is not new. I saw it happening uh, over 20 years ago. Um, before the internet, 95% of the voiceover was union. You couldn't get arrested if you weren't union. Most agents wouldn't represent you if you weren't union. And today, mainstream animation is still well over 90% union. And that's because of celebrities and the fact that it's a scale industry. This, the kind of stuff you're talking about, uh, which is, it's real. You know, there's a lot of, of uh, you know, non-union YouTube uh, web series content out there. Mm -hmm. um, that won't necessarily lead to a series on Cartoon Network. Right. But if, you're, if your work is good, uh, it might get the attention of an agent who can then guide you uh to it bigger and better um so the the growth of the online non-union voiceover industry is the result of what i call the perfect storm it was the uh the birth of the the uh voice one two threes voices.coms etc online casting companies uh, that coincided with the commercial strike of 2000. We could not work. And all of a sudden, these entities had actors and they would contact the buyers, the ad agencies, and said, we've got actors for you. Now, we had never experienced anything like, like the internet in the history of the world, uh, let alone show business. There have been lots of tech disruptions 
throughout the decades uh, since from vaudeville to today, there have been lots of tech disruptions. Um, silent movies did away with vaudeville. Sound did away with silent movies. Um, television impacted movies, huge, which is why movie studios started producing TV. Um, cable impacted network TV. Streaming's impacting all of it. From since the, uh, the, the, the beginning of SAG, with every tech disruption, everything stayed union until the internet. And it was the internet that uh, literally handed the voiceover industry to people outside of the major markets of LA, New York, and Chicago. People who never fathomed that they would get uh, in their, in their, in their uh, office, home studio, in their pajamas, the opportunity to compete in voiceover. The union did nothing about this. Why did they do nothing about this? And, and, and people rightly blame the union for not stepping in and doing something about it for reasons I just talked about. Number one, what's the internet? What's the, the outreach of the internet? We have never had anything that threatened an industry like voiceover. Nobody from Leo Burnett to Tide to McDonald's will, will ever hire non-union talent for major campaigns. It had never been done, no matter what the tech was, no matter what the disruption was. And nobody at the union in the boardroom worked non-union voiceover. They were oblivious that this was happening. It was happening outside their backyard. So put that all together, the union didn't do anything about something they didn't know about. You can't do something if you don't know about it. Yeah. So me, uh, being a, an animation voiceover coach who would do weekend workshops all over the country, I would go to Dallas and St. Louis and Nashville and Portland and uh, all over the country. And at the time, I, mainstream animation, and like today, it was, it was union. Nobody had a desire to be union. And I, I actually depressed them when I told them, no, you got to be union to pursue. You want to be on a, on, a, on a Disney Channel cartoon or a Cartoon Network cartoon or a Nickelodeon cartoon, you got to be union. Yeah. And you got to live in Los Angeles. So people were, were depressed by that. But over time, and you also have to factor in the word value. I don't get any value out of a session fee. Zero. Whoop de freaking do. It's a session fee. My value comes from pension and health that is paid into with every job I do and residuals. An actor of my, I hate the word stature, but it's true. We live and breathe residuals, which is why we're on strike right now. We'll talk about that later. But you go to middle America who they're handed the, uh, the voiceover industry non-union on a silver modem in the privacy of their home. They don't understand the concept of residuals. They never, they, they residuals go to Mer Meryl Streep and Tom Hanks, not a, a average day-to-day -day voiceover actor. They got a, a, a retirement plan with their financial planner. They could get private health insurance. They never expected to get P&H from the voiceover work they're getting from voice123voices.com and their regional agents across the country. And then you add more than half the country is right to work. Yeah. And I will tell you that, that I was, there was a time I was writing a book on voiceover agents. I had interviewed every agent right. in the country, asking everyone the same 50 questions. What do you demand in demos? What's the best way to get your attention? Uh, what, what, what do you expect your actors to have as home studios? What are mistakes actors make? All of them got the same questions. And, and it was great. They were all different. But by the time I was ready to publish it, the world had changed too much. The questions, the answers weren't the same and it became obsolete. And a lot of actors weren't working with agents anymore and they didn't desire agents. A certain level still did, still do. But for the most part, they didn't. So um, this is all due to the internet. All of this is due to the internet. Now here is the problem. There are people who are making great livings doing non-union voiceover work. But there's a tiny percentage that still want 
to break into my level. And they're frustrated that they can't. And they've got nothing but excuses. You got to move to LA if you want to pursue animation. I can't. Then, then, then there's plenty of voiceover work to be had where you are. Well, what about COVID and home studios? People are leaving LA left and right who do cartoons to live anywhere but. But they're leaving with a substantial career. Right. You're not going to get the bulk of the auditions living in Dayton, Ohio, right. even if you're brilliant. Even with the internet, even with the internet. So people want to have it both ways. You can't have it both ways, at least today. Um, but again, the cream floats to the top. My agent, I'm with uh, Heather Dane at Atlas. I've had actors all over the country who are brilliant, who she has said, move to LA, let's talk. But I can't work with you right now. And perhaps there are some she has said, yep, let's work together. I, my gut tells me not necessarily animation, perhaps promo trailer, narration, commercials, et cetera. Um, the internet is a blessing and a curse. You mentioned uh, resources like Talking Tunes, which is so good, yes. and VO Buzz Weekly, which is a college course. They're, yes. And, Seriously, and everyone look those up. Oh, my gosh. And they're free. Yes, free, free. They're free. Completely. I mean, I used to use, I used to use for, pe for people that don't know, there was a thing called a telephone book. They had the yellow pages and the white pages. Yellow pages were for businesses. White pages were residential. I would use both those books to call Hanna-Barbera and Disney and Filmation. And I would use the white pages to call working voiceover actors and, hey, can, and, and studios. And I would hang out in studios and just be a fly on the wall watching all these major voice actors coming in and out. And I would chat with them in, in the lobby and in the parking lot. Everyone's available now on the internet. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody, especially in voiceover, they're nice. They respond. They correspond. So it's, it's a wonderful, 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 blessed tool. But it also makes tools out of blessed people. People are committing career suicide by their day-to-day -day ego postings. Talking about auditions, all they want is a pat on the back from their from their people, their followers. Hey, I had my first audition. You look so amateur. And maybe that's the level of voiceover you want to pursue. God bless you. Have to go with God. I love you. But you're pissing off professionals. It looks really desperate and needy. Yeah. It, look, think of it this way. Uh, before the internet. And we would go to auditions in our agents' offices or go to casting. You didn't, you wouldn't walk into that lobby and announce to everybody, I got an audition today. I got a call back. I booked it. Booked it. People would look at you like you were creepy, narcissistic, unprofessional, childish, etc. You've got a bigger audience on the internet. And why is my career? not going anywhere because you're committing career suicide by being so desperate and needy. Not your fault. You're conditioned to be this machine, this industry called the internet was designed to emotionally control you and everybody else. I'll give you another example how the internet and social media has Please. hurt people in the voiceover industry. Um, I was part of an ensemble group uh, and still am. Uh, who do a lot of animated features and uh, was called in to do a sequel. I don't know if it was part two, part three, part four, part five, I forget, uh, of, a, of a film franchise. Same group of actors. <laughs> and, there was an, and there was an actor missing who'd been part of our ensemble group. And I said, oh, is so-and-so sick? And the, the director of the film said, you know, he, he probably didn't realize what he had done, but he kind of bad mouthed a movie I had done. He may not have even known I did it, but it pissed me off. And I was like, I don't like toxic. I don't like negativity. So I don't need to bring him in because what's he going to say about an another movie I, I did? My point is actors every day are posting. What did you guys think of so-and-so? I know it's making a lot of money, but I thought it was crap. They have no idea that their agent is prepping an audition for somebody that might have worked on that crap. Yeah. People are putting their foot in their mouth, committing career suicide by bad mouthing stuff 
you might as well just say, I don't want to work for that network because I'm bad mouthing this reality show. It's it's just because amazing. you can doesn't mean you should. Mm -hmm. This is not freedom of speech. This is being smart business. You, you've got, as far as I'm concerned, you've got the right to do this, but you're an idiot. So again, this is the, the, the downside of the power that is the internet. It's like taking out a full page in Daily Variety when it was a daily paper and on a full page ad on the back, bad mouthing a franchise. Because more people see it on the internet than they, they would in, in, in the subscription circulation. It's true. And it's so widespread and so available. And I, my feeling is that everyone seems to think that, that their opinion needs to be out there. I mean, it, it, it's just commonplace and it's not, it's the culture of today and it's not second guess at all. And um, for most people who aren't in the industry, they can share the, they can share freely their opinions of Doritos and whatever brands they want and it probably won't bite them in any way. But if you are stepping into this industry, you have to be careful and uh, you have to be smart. Like you said, it's a business. And I'm really glad you touched on that because my next question was really, what advice would you have to newer actors on social media with it being a huge part of the industry, uh, both positively and negatively it can be an incredible way to promote or to self-produce, put yourself out there. Um, I don't know if you have anything else you want to touch on in terms of that, but you think you covered it pretty well already. Well, one thing I'll cover, um, when I was like 16 to about 19, I would spend all day Saturday doing uh, a workout group, but it was with the top uh, voiceover actors in the industry. It was, it was Don LaFontaine and Danny Dark, Jack Angel, Steve Schatzberg, uh, 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 just Bernie Anderson. I mean, just look all these, these names up if you haven't. <laughs> oh my God, Google these names. You're talking yeah. about, we're talking about the creme de la creme. And I have yeah. no idea why they allowed me to be part of this group. Uh, my mother and father were like, are they creepy? I mean, you're a kid. I'm like, I, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know after the first one. And, and they were fantastic. And just being at the mic with these genius voice actors pushed me way beyond my comfort zone. Uh, took me up notches that I, I could never get to their level as a talent because I, I, I never, nobody could, they were that good. The best part of the, um, of the uh, Saturdays was lunch. Because at lunch, we would talk, they would give me war stories and advice, marketing advice, career advice. Don LaFontaine, one of the best advice he ever gave me. Always carry yourself as a successful actor and never break character. All people are doing on social media is posting negativity, their woes, their anger, their frustration, their neediness. And all they're looking for is an e-hug. But all they're doing is investing in negativity and perpetuating it. Yep. People ask me, how are you? Great, even if I'm not. Why? Because I'm not going to bore you with my woes. And I've been taught from my parents to... Those who taught me acting and voiceover, put on a smile and let the world know that you're great. Even if you're not, you got to vent, call a friend, but don't advertise right. on social media that things are going lousy. The other thing that Don told me, which is probably why they uh, embraced me into this group, um, always associate with people on a larger boat than you. Rub elbows with people who have the career that you want. Do not seek advice from people on the same or smaller boat as you. And all I'm seeing on social media is people asking people on the same boat as they how to do it. Well, you're going to find out how to do it at the same level over and over and over again. I said I wasn't going to talk about how I got into the business, but I called Mel Blank. I... Casey Kasem got me my first agent. I'm in this workout group as a teenager, well before I was uh, pursuing this business with the top people in the business. I would hang out at Bell Sound and Fred Jones recording, Google these names, and Hanna-Barbera, and Filmation, and B&B &B Sound. I would just hang out in the lobby, and I would make sure that I was known by the people who had the career I wanted. 
if I wanted to find back then, demos were on reel to reel. And agents had what they called their house reel, which is a giant reel to reel with a one minute snippet of their top talent. And they would send that out to ad agencies and animation, casting directors, et cetera. And I didn't know what the creme de la creme's demos sounded like. So I would call the agents pretending to be a producer. Hey, I'm producing some commercials. Can I get your commercial house reel? Sure. They would send it to me. Why? Because I might get their clients a job. That's how I learned how demos sounded. Today, idiots online are going to voiceover groups going, saying, I took a couple of classes. I'm demo ready. Why haven't you gone to CESD's website, Atlas's website, uh, Vox's website, EBO, DPN, A3, and listened to the top 10? You have no excuse because of this wonderful thing called the internet. And it's free. This is Again, the free. Wonder- <laughs> Yes, and free. And you don't have to lie to get a copy of the demos. <laughs> no, you don't have to drive to the studio and lie to the receptionist. <laughs> but stop asking advice for people on the same or smaller boat as you. Go to the people who have the career that you want. And again, going back to your first question, you're going to find out. Ain't nothing going to be instant about this. Yeah. And that's why I have you here. That's why I have you here to give this advice to people who are looking for that. And oftentimes probably getting sometimes solicited, sometimes unsolicited advice from people who are on that boat or smaller. Um, It happens all the time. It happens all the time. Well, well, the one one thing that, that frustrates the heck out of me and I'm very active on voiceover pages. I, if people ask a question and I have an answer, I'm going to give it. On any page, can you anybody give me advice on how to start? Why haven't you searched this page first, starting out in voiceover and seeing the plethora of information and advice? Oh, another free piece of uh, resource. I want to be a voiceactor.com, which is yeah. D. Bradley Baker's brilliant college course. That's, I mean, from what's voiceover to, okay, I have an agent. Now what? Yeah. I and everything it. in between. Uh, please. Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah. It is brilliant. I mean, his, his section on home studios, I've got no money. I've got nothing but money and everything in between. People, use your just common sense. It's there. But this is not their fault either. Because as I said, the cream floats to the top. There's, there's a common denominator amongst those who are successful as artists, as doctors, as attorneys, anything professional. They've got the it factor. They've got something in their DNA, in their, in their gray matter that nothing will stop them. They wake up every day saying, what more can I do? Not how fast can I do it? How easy can I do it? What shortcuts can I take? Um, If something doesn't work out for them, they don't play the victim or the blame game. Victim and blame game is rampant on social media and the internet. They look in the mirror and say, how could I have done better to have won this? What what, what should I, what should, what should I do next time to get what I want Uh, rather than the, the miles of excuses are nauseating. And the, and it's not different today than it was when I started out. There's just more of them. I mean, you know, it, it just the internet opened up floodgates where, yes. you know, back when I, when I started out and I would go to voicecasters in Burbank for an audition for a commercial, it would be me up against 20 people. And they're all in the same lobby with me. Today, it's 2,000 people for a Minnesota lottery radio spot. So it was much harder to get a job due to the internet. But I was always surrounded by the best. The internet has created this e-generation gap and this e-distance where people aren't taking the risk. You've got to risk if you want success. They aren't taking the risk to reach out to the people that have the career they want. Um, And sometimes they want the safe, easy way because they fear uh, failure. I get that. Then maybe, oh, this is the other thing, Boone. You don't have to be this successful. You can just have fun. There's nothing wrong with that. You do fan dubs. You can just schmooze and chat and just do this for a blast. That's okay. You know, you don't have to pursue at my level. But if you want to pursue at my level, don't lie to yourself. Yeah. Just, you know, you've got to make the investment and take the risks. 
which is financial and creative, those risks. That's the thing. I think the self-honesty is the most important part. Because yeah, mm. whatever whatever your relationship is with performing is your relationship. But you have you to bet. you have to make you a decision bet. at some point as what do you want and, and be clear on it before you spend a bunch of money and then you can, you know, have an informed But you go but but look, look the, the, the the I wanna be a voice actor dot com, Bio Buzz Weekly, talk and tunes. If you really take the time to absorb all three of those resources thoroughly, that's gonna take you months. That's true. Months. Yeah, there's hundreds of episodes on that on VO Buzz Week. Hundreds so, of episodes yeah. where you just start to start start a database. Uh, oh, Sandy Schnarr, AVO. Write that down. Here's what she demands from actors and likes and demos. Heather Dame, Atlas Talent. Oh, look, it's Rob Paulson. Oh, look, it's Bob Bergen. Oh, look, it's Maurice LaMarche, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you're only associating with the best of the best, the tops in the field, without spending a dime. Yeah. And it, and it's it's so available and I can't I really can't highlight it enough, especially I want to be a voice actor dot com just as a starting place. All of those interviews are fantastic. But if you really yeah. day one, it will just it gives you everything. Like you said, and people people have this illusion that or delusion that if they buy the equipment, the career will come. You know, what mic should I get starting out your smartphone? Yeah. I used to use a little portable cassette recorder. Took it with me everywhere. I would hear a waiter. Well, to, to this day, if I hear a waiter with an interesting voice, I put my phone on the table and push record on the memo. I say, can you repeat the specials again just to get that voice right? That's fantastic. Oh, my God. I plagiarize all the time. Yes. Well, we have, I've, yes. Yes. I've used family. I've used friends. I've used teachers. I had an audition yesterday for a new a new series where I used combination of a teacher and a friend and a family member all yeah. three into one character and you know if i get it um if they call me on it is that a little bit of so-and-so yes it is yeah. uh, and i and i will take them to dinner or thank them some way um yeah. look that's what we do but you god uh d bradley baker said it at uh at, at comic-con several years ago when we were promoting um a, a documentary called I, I know that voice Another great Somebody, resource, not quite free. Another great resource, About yes. $3 to rent, I think, so. There you go. Uh, somebody asked um, asked us the, on the panel what microphones we recommended, what, what DAWs we recommended, uh, recording programs, et cetera. And D asked, what level are you at voiceover? Oh, I'm just starting out. And D goes, look, if you want to play in an orchestra, you don't buy a tuba and apply. You study, you become the world's greatest tuba player and you audition when you're ready. Don't go out there and spend thousands of dollars on equipment when you've got nothing within you creatively, talent wise, to show your wares. You're not ready to do that. And one bad, bad audition closes more doors than a good one opens. I think that's something that a lot of people are struggling to realize. And I think it took me a long time to realize that too. So highlight that as well. And I also, you know, my last two questions are, are really about, I, I want to, I, I didn't, I wrote a lot of these, I pretty much wrote all of this before the strike officially started. But I think just given that I have you here and you've been in this industry for decades and have experienced multiple SAG strikes and have been very involved in the union, I just want to give you the floor really to go over that question I was going to talk about, which is being in the industry for so long, seeing it change. What is that experience like? How do you how would you compare starting out versus now getting into the industry now versus getting into the industry in the 80s? And I also want to, you know, give you an opportunity through that, through that lens to maybe talk about the union now and what's going on and why it's going on. And, and also, I think a lot of people, maybe people who are watching this, maybe younger actors, newer actors, aren't as familiar with the union and its purpose and um, the contracts and agreements that we all work under. So I would want I, I know it's a very open-ended question, but I want to give yeah. you the opportunity to just talk about whatever you feel is relevant, given the, yeah. the current state of our industry right now. Well, I'm going to start with, I'm going to go backwards a little bit. I'm going to start with Please. the differences between, and let's talk animation because that's what yeah. I'm pretty well known for. Um, it is so much easier to, and cheaper 
to pursue animation voiceover today than it was when I started out. So I got my first agent, my first job uh, a week out of high school. I had been studying voiceover at age, starting with age 14, got my first, uh, got professional at 18, uh, and didn't start making a living at this uh, until I was, I think, 23, I think. Um, yeah, 23. So it took me five years being a represented uh, actor auditioning to be able to be a full-time actor. When I started studying voiceover and my voice had not changed yet, and I just, I'd never studied acting. Um, I was told by everybody, pursue voiceover, but animation, it's not gonna happen. It's too difficult. There are only three networks doing Saturday morning cartoons. Disney hadn't been active with animated features in years. They might've had a, a release every five to seven years. Most of their releases were re-releases of classic Disney movies. Um, and I didn't care that people were saying it's gonna be difficult, um, but I was close with June Foray and you know, uh, everybody would say, look, they've got Mel Blanc, they've got June Foray, they've got Frank Welker, they've got Michael Bell, they've got everybody, uh, Janet Waldo, they don't need you. And I still thought, I don't care. I'll let the industry tell me that, okay? I love that um, so much. <laughs> yeah, so now let's cut to today. There are 24 seven networks devoted to animation. We have primetime cartoons. We have streaming cartoons. Every major motion picture studio has a thriving animation department. We have games. There is more work and more opportunities today for those who want to pursue animation voiceover than in the history of the entertainment industry. That is a huge difference uh, from when I got in. But another difference is there's more competition. There weren't as many people pursuing it back then. Again, the internet opened up the floodgates. Even in Los Angeles, there are more people pursuing voiceover today in Los Angeles than ever before. Now let's talk about the strengths. My, I quit my, my last full-time survival job, I was a tour guide at Universal Studios uh, from age 18 to 23. I was on a handful of shows and my career was going well. Um, I was actually fired from Universal. Um, I had 32 sick days my last year there because my voiceover career had kind of taken off and I got called into the manager's office and got lectured, hey, listen, we have to let you go. We can't afford to keep you here because you keep calling and saying it. And I was like, yeah, but what if the acting stops? Well, then you can come back. Okay. Um, so from 18 to 23, while I was a tour guide at Universal, I lived on my tour, uh, Universal salary and I banked all my voiceover jobs. And, and once Universal let me go, I realized, oh my gosh, I had two years worth of savings of living expenses when Universal let me go. What that meant was I can pursue this full time and live without struggle. For, I mean, we're talking uh, groceries and car payments and car insurance. I had it all. I had health insurance because that's what the union did for me. I made health insurance from year one. And I was, I was vested to get a pension at 65 by year 10. That's what the union does for you. Okay, just saying. Um, so I had two years worth of living expenses. Then we went on strike. The cartoon voice actors went on strike. That was my first strike. And <clears throat> even though I'd worked a bit over those five years, I didn't really know um, my fellow voice actors that well. It was on the picket line that I got to really get to know personally the people that I'd worked with um, and respect. Um, and some of the, some, some who aren't here anymore, you know, a lot who aren't here anymore because um, we're talking almost 40 years ago. So 
uh, that sense of community. I understood the, the issues back then were cartoon voiceover session for TV. This is called episodic. The contract had us there up to eight hours and unlimited voices. Yeah, different now. And we went on, yeah, we went on strike. Uh, we wanted a four hour session and we uh, settled for scale for the first two voices and additional 10% for the third. It's been the same contract ever since. It never took eight hours to do a, an episodic cartoon. But by committing to eight hours, it meant your agent couldn't book you for anything else that later that day. So that's why we went on strike then. Today, it's all about streaming and it's all about AI. So let's talk about why streaming and why it is so important, not just for the, uh, I would say, middle class journeyman actor, but also celebrities. So in 1960, SAG and the WGA went on strike for TV residuals and a pension and health plan, and they won both. At a time when the industry said to them, uh, this is not uh, realistic, we, we, we can't do this, but they did. Uh, in the early 80s, we saw, well, actually the mid 70s is when HBO started. And then we saw home video and basic cable and pay cable. And with every new tech that came with broadcasting and the entertainment industry, management kept saying to us, we cannot pay you the residuals that we paid on network TV because we have no idea where this tech is going to go. It's not profiting for us. So we have to give you a fraction of what you've got for network. In the old days, if you did one guest star, on a on a primetime TV show, in summer reruns, you made enough to feed your family. You did really well. Did three or four episodes a year. You made your health benefits. You got your pension. All was great. People on streaming today are making less on an entire season than they did on one episode in the in, in the eighties on network TV. That's why we're fighting for streaming residuals. And with each tech disruption or advancement uh, from cable to SVOD, which is a subscription video on demand, that's Netflix, that's Hulu, that's Amazon. AVOD is advertising video on demand, which is YouTube. With each one of these tech disruptions, we got worse and worse deals because management kept saying to us, well, we don't know how this is going to profit for us, so we can't offer any kind of more profit sharing for you. In fact, we have to adjust it from the last one. So with each subsequent tech, we got less and less from, from network uh, television. What does that mean? Everything is streamed today. Everything. Old, new, uh, series that are new, series that are old. People are making less. Less and less and less. I mean, people are posting, you know, zero residual checks from a streaming company from a show that on network or syndication would have fed their family. So that's why we're on strike right now, because it's like enough is enough. You can't make a living. Celebrities who had a series that ran for five, 10 years can't make a living on those residuals. And it's affecting our pension and health because our pension. Pension and health is paid based on uh, when we get paid, whether it's a session fee or a residual, the percentage is put into the pension and health pool. And if we're making less and less, that's getting paid into less and less. Less and less, we're making less and less a year, less and less dues, because our dues is based on a percentage of our annual income. That's one reason why we're on a strike, the streaming and residuals. Um, and then there's AI. Uh, we should have been battling this years ago, but we didn't. Over two years ago, people saw those Tom Cruise deep fakes and just saw the cool factor. But nobody did anything about it, including Tom Cruise. When he was uh, asked to comment, he thought it was he thought it was cool. And his agents that that's cool. That's kind of that's interesting. 
that was where our union failed us. Our union should have gone to Tom Cruise, his agents, and said, let's lobby Congress because this is bigger than the movies. Let's go to the, uh, the major studios. Let's, let's make this a, a federal crime to use deep fake audio or video to make it sound like, because I've, I've said from the very beginning, I'm, I'm less worried about uh, losing profit as an entertain, in the entertainment industry as an actor than I am uh, AI using, being used to incriminate Right. to make it look like a politician said something during an election that they didn't say or make it make it look like an actor said something uh wrong that they that they didn't a day before their major movies being released to to, to lose box office this is going to happen um we, we we dropped uh we dropped the ball two three years ago for that but what we're doing right now and why celebrities are involved is celebrities want their voice and their image protected. What we are looking for is protections and profit sharing. When they use our image or our voice, we want the right to give them permission. And we want to be able to negotiate for what it's for. And wherever it, wherever it goes, if it's a commercial, if it's a movie, if it's a TV show, if it's a toy, we want compensation for that. We want applicable residuals, just like if they took a line from a movie that they wanted to put into another movie, they have to pay us to lift it and pay us residuals when it's broadcast. So we want the same thing. And that's what we're fighting for. And we can't give this up and we can't compromise because we compromise with every tech disruption leading up to this from home video to cable to streaming, et cetera. We can't do that again. And that's what we're fighting for. Now, we talked at the very beginning of this about how voiceover has, union voiceover has eroded. I predict this is going to bring a lot of non-union people back to the union. And here's why. When we win this, and I think we will, it'll only, the union voiceover that will have AI protections and profit sharing. The non-union voiceover industry, as everybody knows, is the Wild West. There are amazing organi organizations like NAVA, which is like more organized than our union has ever been for the voiceover community. Uh, Tim Friedlander is a king, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and they've got a wonderful writer for people to use and, and ask buyers to put into a contract, which is great. Let's say that 90% of the non-union world is successful in uh, applying this rider and buyers are, uh, are using it. Hey, sure, that means 10% aren't. That 10% represents millions of jobs, dollars, et cetera. This, this is the same reason why the non-union voiceover industry evolved. Because when, when it started, there were a lot of people who said, I'm not doing that. No, I am I'm not doing that. I'm not doing non-union. That's just going to dumb down the industry. It's, it's, going to, it's going to erode the union voiceover industry. But you only need one person to say yes. And it ruins it for everybody. And over time, there's two people and 20 people and 2,000 people, et cetera. The same thing will happen with AI and the non-union voiceover industry. Trust me, this is history repeating itself with AI versus non-union voiceover. So I really think that the silver lining when we win this strike is if people want a career in voiceover, I don't care if we get 5 10% of the uh, non-union community back to the union. That's a, that's a tremendous amount of income to the union, to our yeah, P and H, to our dues. It's a huge win. And actors are gonna see residuals for the first time in their life and understand, oh, I get it. Yeah. I get it. I had zero jobs this month, but I made 10 grand in residuals. Mm. So um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but again, if, if this, type of career isn't for you that's okay you don't have to do it yeah that's right 
That's right. That's everyone's individual decision. And oh my goodness, you've wrapped that up so neatly and so well. And that's exactly why I wanted to have you here. Well, one of the many reasons, but to have someone with your experience in the industry, to be able to talk about strikes from years past and how they relate to now and how history is repeating itself, to be able to see the patterns and recognize them and explain them to people who don't have that same context is just fantastic. And I really appreciate it. So how are you doing on time? I had one more question I wanted to get to. I got, I got, another, I got another, I got another, okay. I got another, I'm waiting for a storm. I'm good. Good. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. I'll do, I have one more that I wanted to ask and then I will, I'll give you yeah. the opportunity to plug, plug your thing, which I'm very excited about. But, um, you know, we've given, I think in this interview, you've given a lot of advice to people who specifically know for sure they want to get into voiceover. And I'm sure you see people at conventions constantly who may not have ever had any interest in acting or performing before, but they love cartoons, they love video games, whatever it is, they want to do that. And they're dead set on it. Um, I hear that question asked all the time and I've heard it answered all the time of how those what those people should do. So I'm curious to to flip it up a little bit if we were to talk about the person who has been a professional actor for maybe a few years, maybe several years, someone who has acting chops, has experience, has been working on camera or whatever in some other part of the industry, maybe on stage. Um, but now they've, now they've discovered voiceover. Well, maybe we'll limit it to cartoons uh, because that's kind of more the focus. What advice would you have to those people who think, I want to give this a shot. I think I would really like this. Well, the fact that they come uh, with a, an acting background uh, from training to uh, practical work is uh, a plus, a huge plus. Um, <clears throat> but it's sort of like, um, you know, an actor who is known for sitcoms for like five years, wants to do Shakespeare, has never studied Shakespeare. They should study Shakespeare. If they go to an audition without understanding text, without understanding um, rhythm, language, um, the, the, the time, the period that those wonderful plays took place and were written, they're not going to be able to put their sitcom timing experience into Hamlet. So you got to study. Same goes with voiceover. If you want to do cartoons first of all cartoon does not mean cartoon not all cartoons require uh a smirk certainly um, not these days that's for sure too <laughs> oh yeah absolutely yeah, much there's, more grounded yeah absolutely um but they should still study animation they need a demo that that kicks ass a demo that consists of original characters not voices nobody cares how vocally versatile you are that's a dime a dozen they want a minute and a half of brilliance, brilliant acting, original characters. You want your characters doing, not just saying or commenting on the situation. They, they should be involved in the situation. And just like a commercial demo reflects today's uh, advertising landscape, or a promo demo reflects today's broadcast landscape, animation character demo reflects today's animation landscape. What does that mean? Well, how are your Nickelodeon at 3 p.m. characters different from your Disney 3 p.m. characters? How are your Fox primetime characters different from Adult Swim? How are your PBS kids characters different from Nick Jr.? Or how is your Marvel versus DC? Do you know what Colette Sunderman is looking for in a Marvel cartoon? Do you know what, what uh, Maria Estrada is looking for in a preschool cartoon? You need to know the animation industry. You've got that wonderful free tool, the internet. Just start cross-referencing every program, every movie, every actor, every agent. Immerse your study. Study, 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 study with everybody. And get to the point where you are demo ready. Um, Mary Lynn Wissner has this wonderful, uh, uh, I call it's a I call it a workshop called VO Pros, where you get an opportunity to showcase, read, get mic and FaceTime with agents and casting directors and et cetera. Same with Van Voice Actors Network. Van's a little bit 
a little, I think you need agency representation to do Van, I'm pretty sure. I think, I think uh, so, yeah. I think so. But this is a business about relationships. So if you are a working, trained actor looking to break into animation, you start with study, you get demo ready, you make sure that you're relevant, that your characters are original. If you happen to have a commercial agent where there's a voiceover department, the best way to get an agent interested is a referral. But agents are only interested in impressive referrals. So if it's the commercial agent at the agency who can walk your demo into, I don't walk demos in anymore. That was, I yeah. did myself. You can email your demo to the office down the hall. Yeah. Great. If you're, if you're looking for a, if you don't have a commercial agent and you need a referral in the industry, you've probably hopefully studied with enough people like, uh, and by the way, you don't want your referral to be actors or coaches. That doesn't hold the same weight as a casting director, a voice director, uh, a producer, et cetera. I can guarantee anybody, be it um, Natanya at DPN, Heather at Atlas, Kathy Lizio at CESD, Cynthia at SBV. If that subject line says referred by Colette Sunderman, referred by Christy Reed, referred by Charlie Adler, referred by Maria Estrada, et cetera, Google those names if you don't know who they are. That's yeah. going to hold a ton of weight. They're going to listen right away. Why? Well, because those casting slash voice directors hire talent from this agency every single day. If this actor is brilliant and this casting director loves this actor enough to refer them, the actor's going to be an easier sell to pitch for yeah. the next audition. In the body of the cover letter, even if you're a working actor, List what you've done on TV, on stage. Comedy, huge. Uh, I'm in the Sunday group at the Groundlings, huge. Um, uh, these, I was in these touring Broadway shows, huge. Um, and then list the people that know you and that you know them. I have read for and met all of these animation directors and casting directors. All of this together um, makes you more desirable over the person who just says seeking representation. Here's my demo, lovely cover letter. Also, before you submit to an agent, go to social media and look at the agent's social media presence. Learn something about them. I'll give you an example. Let's say you look at an agent's page and you see the agent and their spouse all over the place wine tasting and in your cover letter um when i'm not uh, in my booth uh or editing auditions uh my spouse and i love to go up to Paso robles for wine tasting um just pepper that in yeah you know you're connecting with a person not just uh, uh an agent who's going to get 10 percent if you work yeah you know, humanize people. people. Humanize, exactly, exactly. You know, what should go in the cover letter? The same thing that should go in a cover letter of any profession. Uh, here's what I have to offer as a professional. Here's who I am as a person. Yeah. Yeah. Nip, yeah, absolutely. Agents want to know both things. And I, I don't know yeah. if you're familiar with this, but you've just reminded me. I know there are these applications people use now through social media. Somehow I don't completely understand how it works where they actually blast out a, a generic uh, submission to sometimes hundreds of agencies. So it's one, they, and I, I, I've never heard it work for anyone, and I, I'm not that's surprised. The most, that's the tackiest, most impersonal. That shows the lazy, desperate person who doesn't want to invest in the time. Um, oh, my God. And then people, where do I get copy for my demo? And people have all of these same places where people have used the same copy over and over and over again. Yeah. Oh my God, people, be unique, be original, be an individual. Nobody in this industry needs another voice or any genre of voiceover. They got all the commercial actors, animation actors, promo actors, narration actors they'll ever need. And most of them aren't working. What they don't have and what they do need is you, your individuality, your personality, your sense of humor, your heart. There's, there's a uniqueness about us all 
that if you are talented enough to put yourself in your commercial reads, in your cartoons, in anything that we do as an actor, where you're not just another voice reading, nobody can say they have somebody like you if you are on that audition or that demo. The problem is most of the time, 90% of the demos, 95 or more percent of the demos, the actor's nowhere to be heard. A great read is there. Who cares yeah. what you do? There are that dozen. But the actor isn't there. The personality isn't there. And then you're going to go, well, how, how different are we? I don't know. Um, compare Dustin Hoffman to Tom Hanks. Compare um, Phyllis Diller to Lily Tomlin. Yeah. They know their voice. They know their, they, they know their brand. Know your brand. Yeah. And, and don't I, hire oh. a brand person to create a brand for you. They're doing something for a buck. I'm not against that, by the way. Hardly. But you go to the brand person and say, here's my brand. Let's work on this together. Not make, or don't send a note to your friends. Hey, everybody, give me 10 colors that represent me. <laughs> what, fl what flowers do I like? Right. What, what, when you think of food, no, that's, that's correct. If you don't know yourself, don't rely on everybody else to tell you who you are. That's your job. And that's how you know you're ready to pursue this. Make a demo. Seek an agent. Put yourself out there. Yes. Yes. Uh, you, you've you touched on so many things. I'm so glad to wrap up that way. I was just going to say specifically because you've touched on it earlier a little bit with demos. Can I, can I, can I end with yes, one quick please, thing? Please. Positive note. On a very positive note, they hold auditions every day because they're always looking for the next great thing. They could hire any one of us, you included, if they, I'm, all, all of us who, who, who work today could probably do a decent job with any piece of copy we're handed, but they're holding auditions because wouldn't it be exciting? I mean, Mary Lynn Wissner tells me all the time she gets so excited when she gets an actor their first job. Yeah. Because there are brilliant actors out there. All they need is that break. And there's mediocre actors out there looking for that break, not sure why they're doing it or why it's not happening. And in their heart, they know. But guys, they hold auditions. We have to audition every day. Why? Because they're looking for the next great thing. I, I'm, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that I gave you that moment to end on that positive note because it's a wonderful note. And the only thing I was going to say was just to go back to what you were saying about demos earlier. It's just a cautionary tale, I think. But don't, don't go to a demo producer if you don't know who you are because... They will, they will be happy to tell you and take your money. So oh. that, that's something I want to just make sure everyone knows. And you, you put yeah. it so well. So I wanted to highlight that. Um, yeah, be careful out there, everybody. But thank you so much, Bob. I want to give you the opportunity now to plug, you know, oh. like any anything and everything that you're allowed to. And just I'm giving you the floor. Some things I can't plug because of a strike. Some things mm -hmm. I can't plug because of an NDA. Yep. So, um Cartoon-wise, Looney Tunes cartoons. Um, cartoons are not strike. I can talk about them. Bugs Bunny Builders, Spidey and those amazing friends. It's Pony. Uh, Do Drop Diaries. All kinds of stuff. Um, the big thing I want to I want to promote. What is this launch, by the way? Can oh, you, you know what? Out? It's I don't know for sure, but within a week of t this, oh, probably. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So um, next January. Uh, Mary Lynn Wissner and I are doing a voiceover cruise. It's round trip from San Francisco. This is our second. The first one we did right before a thing called COVID. Mm -hmm. And we were going to do it annually, but a virus got in the way. So it is a 10-day Mexican Riviera cruise uh, where uh, all five sea days are voiceover classes. Two days of animation, two days of commercial, one day on marketing, business of the business, Q&A. Um, we're only taking 40 students, uh, as many people in your party who want to come are welcome. Uh, they have to book through us, uh, for, 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 to, 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 to book the, the trip, whether it's a student or not. Um, the information is on my Facebook page. Uh, if people want to email me, Bob at BobBergen.com, I can send you the information. Here's something I know right now. Uh, we don't have a lot of spaces left for students and the ship is filling up. Once the ship fills up, even if we have space for students, we can't take any more because there's only so many cabins. But um, I think we've got, I 
depth of five to 10 or eight to 10 spaces left for students and about a dozen people who have said, uh, I'm gonna be depositing soon. So once we get 40 students, it's booked. And, there's, and then we'll start a backup list in case people drop out, but um, it's fun. And you can be at any level. You could be a working actor and you could be, this could be your first class. When, when, when you're at the mic or at the podium with the instructor, Mary Lynn's doing commercial, I'm doing cartoons. It's you and us, that's it. No competition, a lot of fun. And how bad can voiceover workshops with cocktails be? I mean, let's Not just be very. <laughs> Let's just be honest. Yeah, that's fantastic. What, an, what a unique, fun idea. And I, I had heard about it before, of course, but that's just fabulous. That's so wonderful. So yeah, I, I'm sure this will be up within a week and hopefully there'll still be spots and anyone who's listening should definitely go check that out. Uh, that's cool. what an incredible fun thing. Well, thank you. Mary Lynn Wisner is another name that's come up quite a lot in this interview. So again, I'm just going to tell everyone. To well, I'll tell you up. how I met Mary Lynn. Mary, oh, Lynn was my, Mary Lynn was my very first agent's assistant. Oh my gosh. I didn't know that. Oh yeah. Uh, we were both babies. Um, and my first agent was a guy named Don Pitts and Don left this agency and went to a, a company called JHR. I was still under contract. It was called Commercials Unlimited. That's where Mary Lynn was working. And I was still under contract, so I couldn't leave. And she was my agent for about wow. an hour, hour and 12 minutes. And then when my contract was up, I followed Don, and then and she became a casting director. And she has not looked back. Wow. Well that's, a, well, that's a great story to end on. That's so fun. Okay, we'll definitely look up Mary Lynn Wisner. And... Um... Look up, look up the cruise. Go to you can go to Bob Bergen's website to find a whole bunch more um, that you mentioned calling Mel Blank. There is a portion of that phone call on Bob. It's BobBergen.com, I believe, is the URL. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I was just there, so you should you should listen to it. It's a lot of fun. And also, and also, I'll plug this. I've got fifty plus one to two minute video tutorials on voiceover on my Instagram page. There you go. Just, just in the, again, free, free, yeah. free. And that's, I think, at bergen.bob, I think. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure if you search Bob Bergen on Google, you're going to find all this stuff. It's not too difficult. Yeah. And those are great. I, I have seen a lot of those and I certainly appreciate them on a personal level. So thank and I you also so ask much. To, I ask people to ask me questions and I answer there. But don't ask a question if you don't want an honest answer because I'm always honest. There you I'll go. shut up now. I will shut up. No, I, this is all great. You you can chime in as many times as you want. I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for the time and for your wonderful, illuminating answers. This was my pleasure. Was and really, thank you for your great questions. Thank, really, really smart questions, Boone. Thank you so much. It was truly my pleasure. I really appreciate it. All yeah. right. Well, thank you. Have a great day to everyone watching. And um, I don't know, go watch cartoons. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Bye.